first order of business is the approving the minutes of the February 18th Planning Board minutes. minutes. Uh, I was not in attendance, so I won't be voting. Uh, but I will conduct uh, the vote. Is there any discussion? Corrections? Steve, I had some very minor typos that I would be happy just to give over to Certainly. Alice unless she wants me to go through them page by page. Oh, why don't you just submit those to her okay. if, you, if you want. Mm -hmm. Any other cor uh, corrections other than typos, changes? Seeing none, do I hear a motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All of those in favor of uh, accepting the Planning Board minutes with the typographical errors uh, submitted uh, by Janet, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? It's, uh, four to zero. I abstain. Next order of business uh, is uh, correspondence. Just a very, very short uh, list of correspondence. The first, a memo from Michael uh, McGovern, our town manager, to the planning board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, it's uh, of important nature. I think I'll read through it. At the February Town Council meeting, a process was begun that would uh, have resulted in the Planning and Zoning Board's reviewing proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance relating to accessory apartments. Subsequently, a resident of the town, Coleman Gorham, appealed the town's recent favorable Superior Court decision to the Maine Supreme Court. The town council has asked me to write to you indicating that you should suspend all discussion and review of any amendments relating to accessory apartments until a law is, so, is concluded. Lawsuit is concluded, excuse me. Thank you very much. Okay. The second... Uh, piece of correspondence um, was on the podium this evening, a letter from Carl Pearson, chairman of the appointments committee of the town council, just uh, announcing the annual orientation session for all members of town boards, commissions, and committees. Um, that it will be on Tuesday, March 31, 1992. I urge all uh, committee people to attend. Uh, I try to attend every year. And actually not a piece of correspondence, but uh, an update uh, on the podium when we received was uh, a change or a corrected um, site plan. Larry S. and Antoinette T. Skillings, 427 Mitchell Road. Are there any other pieces of correspondence uh, to come before the board? Seeing none, under other business, we have the election of planning board chair and vice chair something I've been looking forward to for some time. Uh, <laughs> uh, not actually. Um, first order of business under the election of, uh, of officers is the uh, nomination of, uh, for board chair. Do I hear any nominations? Would you like to continue? No, sir. No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> No, ma'am. No, he's just thinking, thinking quick. <laughs> I nominate Judith. Um, Kane? Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This isn't, this is, these are nominations. Uh, this isn't a motion. Yeah, that's right. Is that right? No, I just nominate Okay. Are there any other nominations? Seeing and hearing none, do I hear a motion? Tom has to think about what the motion is. <laughs> Move that Judith be elected chair of the board for the coming year. It's been moved in, do I hear a second? Second. <laughs> been moved in second and now. <laughs> I'll be glad to get off this. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, all of those in favor of Judith Kane as uh, chair for this coming year, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Four zero. Judith abstaining. Uh, last order of business is the election of the vice chair uh, to the planning board. Do I hear any nominations? Tom. I nominate uh, Do I hear any other nominations? I'll second that nomination. Do we need a motion to? <laughs> I 
moved. It, it's moved and seconded. Do I hear any uh, dis further discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor of John McKay, elected as vice chair um, for the coming year, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Support is zero. Vote for one abstaining. Congratulations. Before I hand over the gavel, I'd just like to thank uh, the board members uh, and staff for uh, an enjoyable year. Uh, professionally, it's been a, a trying year, and so I hope I've been able to put uh, as much time and effort as uh, any chair should into the position. Uh, I do look forward to getting back into uh, uh, the playing uh, board member chair and, and uh, digging into some of these uh, applications. I enjoy that role just as much. Uh, but no other ado. Should it? Strange talk. Thank you, Steve, for a good year, and I hope I can do as, half as well as you did, and just keep watching those HHT 200s. <laughs> you are in charge of those. The first order of business tonight is the Tinsman Fitness Center, a request by Thomas Tinsman to table the April meeting of the site plan review of the conversion of approximately 1,000 square feet of office space to a fitness center located at 349 Ocean House Road in accordance with section 19-2-9 of the subdivision ordinance. Is Mr. Tinsman here? No. In which case I'll open it to the board for discussion. There being none, shall we? Do I have a motion? Yes, I um, move that be it ordered that based on the request of Thomas Tinsman for an extension of time to submit plans for the conversion of office space to a fitness center located at 349 Ocean House Road the Planning Board extends the plan review to the regular April the 21st, 1992 meeting of the Planning Board. Any I second the motion. Any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor, please raise your right hands. Opposed? None. Four. Four. None against. The next order of business is Stonegate Phase 4 subdivision. A request by recall management for preliminary subdivision approval, a wetlands alteration permit, and a permit for construction in a resource protection zone for Stonegate, Phase 4, a 17-lot major subdivision located off Stonegate Road in accordance with Section 16-2-4, Paren A, Paren 7 of the subdivision ordinance. Madam Is, Chair? Yes. As I have in the past, uh, I'll have to recuse myself as an officer of the recall management uh, and also of the uh, owner of record. Madam Chair, as I have in the past, I have recused myself because of potential conflict of interest. Thank you. In that case, Judy Lardner and Tim Eichenberg <coughs> are appointed voting members for this item. We have someone here from recall. We do? Indeed. For the record, my name is Rick Light, once again before the board, uh, representing recall management. And with me tonight is, as in the past, Dick Michael, who I left from Dufresne Henry to answer any questions the board may have between the two of us. I think probably the best way to start off to keep this brief is to explain the changes we've made since the last meeting, the public hearing. And then I would like to comment, uh, make a few comments in the course of describing the changes and then maybe open it up to the board's concerns and comments and just spend the time listening to those, if I may. Since the last meeting, uh, we've gone back and, and looked at the plan from a different perspective in certain areas. And I guess probably the way to address the comments is maybe to go through Maureen's letter to the board and just touch upon those issues that we feel are significant. Um, 
Item number one is the engineering revisions. And we believe uh, uh, Mr. Morin from T.Y. Lynn has submitted a letter with some very, very minor uh, administrative type items that uh, need to be labeled on the recording plat. And we would request that those be made as a condition of final plan. They're mostly a very minor, minor administrative item. Uh, number two uh, is the issue of lot 17, and I'll defer to the board here. Lot 17 previously was indicated as a, uh, with a 25 foot right of way, if you remember, in a building envelope, something in nature of here. After receiving comments from the last meeting and then going back and looking at the lot, we, uh, sitting at the table of recall, we, we decided that what we would do is, is sort of a compromise uh, on lot 17. And what we've done is taken lot 49, which is the existing lot of record belonging to Fleet Bank, um, a lot of record of, of Stonegate phase one, I think it's phase one, but if I'm wrong, and combine that with lot 17. So we have a lot area now, a lot with an area of about two and one half acres. However, we've left the building envelope much the same as it was on lot 49, with the exception of we extended that building envelope, as you can see here, back 50 feet from where it was previously. Or, in terms of reference of your plan, the building envelope would be just across the rear lot line of what was lot 49. And that, I think, is, is, a, is a very reasonable compromise. And what that ends up with results is, is this entire, basically the entire 95% of what was lot 17 prior to tonight, part of our submission, is now going to remain within the buffered area. It will be part of the lot, but it will remain under the covenants and restrictions associated with the buffers and all the other lots. Essentially, for the abutters, it will, for all perpetuity, be, a, be one the same with the common open space here in wooded lot. And uh, I think that that presents a real compromise at the same time makes, I think, a, a very remarkable lot in lot 49 with two and a half acres of, of prime land and, a, and an expansion building window. Uh, the next issue I'd like to talk about just briefly uh, is the, in the memo to the board, the item uh, number four. Uh, actually, I'll go back to item number three in terms of the homeowners association. I, the last meeting we indicated that the, the Stonegate project phase four would be amended and merged with the existing homeowners association. Documents were submitted to the board uh, for this meeting, which include the deeds are the covenants and restrictions of the existing homeowners association which we intend to merge with instead of here. Excuse me. And on top of that, we've submitted documents discussing uh, which describe the open space and restrictions on that. Uh, at this time, we have I've made an attempt to contact the homeowners association president, and I think I owe him an apology if he's here in the office. And I was trying to call him on a number that in the phone book that was listed in Gorham until I finally found out that I wasn't calling it. It must have been his old number. So I never made contact with the association president, but I have talked with a member uh, of the association in terms of what, uh, to touch base in terms of what their thoughts are on the entrance. And uh, that leads into a, a question later on in the, uh, another comment later on in the, in the list, which I'll get to. Uh, the Declaration of Covenants, item number four, talks about lot restrictions. As you'll know on your, note on your plans, we've added uh, several notes to the plans over the previous set that you had. But the discussion here resolves, uh, revolves around the existing covenants which, dis which require a 15-foot side yard, no cutting of trees over 8 inches in diameter, and a 25-foot front yard, no cutting of, of trees over 8 inch diameter. And if you remember, the side yards are 25 feet and 40 feet respectively, so in essence between the lot line and the edge of the building envelope, there's still a space of about 10 feet closer to, on the building envelope side of things where, as the language exists now, one could clear trees within the so-called buffer that are eight inches uh, or greater. I, I'd like to just discuss what, why that is there. We don't have a problem with expanding the envelope for the, the buffer so that the side yards no clearing of trees of eight inches or over would be allowed in the side yards or the front yards, the full setback. But I wanted to explain to the board why that is there. There's an additional 10 feet within the side yard setback. 
And I think the thought process there is to clear, if you have a 25 foot side yard setback, to clear the first 15 feet or to allow no clearing, no cutting of large trees in the first 15 feet from the property line, to, uh, and then the, the next 10 feet, to allow clearing of larger trees allows you to sort of form a transition in the canopy from the, the house to the, the buffer area to the lot line, rather than going from the house to the edge of the yard, et cetera, and a, all of a sudden a vertical uh, wall of trees with no real uh, smaller vegetation type of a buffer area. So I think that that was the reason that language was there, but I reiterate, we have no problem with a full 25 or 40 foot uh, limitation on the clearing of, of large trees. And the other revision to the plan, which was noted on the plan submitted to you, I'll point to it here in the plan, is the discussion of the lot easement on lots two and, and three here. What we have done is, is shown the easement for our discussion with the board last time. The, as you remember, there's an existing easement across lot three here. That easement will connect uh, through the corner of actually lot two and three, and we'll, uh, we provided a 15-foot easement across the back of lot two, which ends at the Virgilio lot. As I understand from Mr. Roberts, the Conservation Commission chairman, they have in concept, the Virgilios agreed to connecting the trail system through here. So now we'll allow for the entire connection through here at some time and also down through the Allen Road as discussed at the last meeting. And we have removed at this time the previously shown 30 foot easement along the back of uh, that lot, this lot here. Uh, the other change which was discussed at the last meeting and we took heart to is we it provided some landscaping at the cul-de-sac island and proposed three white spruce in the center of the island. The last issue which I, I touched on briefly uh, a few minutes ago is the, in terms of the association, there was discussion at the last meeting about improvements to the Stonegate entrance at Mitchell Road out here. As you recall, that's basically considered the secondary or non-primary entrance at this point. When phase, I think the thought is when phase four comes in, that really will be the primary entrance off of Mitchell Road for the phase four. Uh, recall would like, they are in full agreement uh, that an entrance there is certainly compatible with the full development of phase four. However, uh, recall takes the position that they would like to have the funds necessary to uh, form those improvements be assessed as uh, through the association, in other words, assessed against each of the lots within the association, rather than the developer having to forfeit money up front uh, out of his pocket for those improvements. And that, I think that's the position they, they take on, on those improvements. Again, I, I've made it an attempt at contact and I apologize for not making a full contact with the association president to discuss that issue. But I believe that is, that's the issue with the association at the entrance to Mitchell Road. I think that wraps up the changes we've made since the last meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Go ahead, Judy. <clears throat> I think I'll do is go down the same memo so okay. you're looking at my comments at the same time. And first off, I'd like to say Lot 17 looks a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with respect to the buffers and whether you would cut within the, after the 15 feet, I think I personally would favor a, a no cut policy just for the record. Um, with respect to lot three, the issue has been raised about the 100 foot wetland setback line. And um, I'm rather ambivalent about that and I'd like to hear what the board has to say. I know the more restrictive you get in the front of that lot, the more the house will possibly be pushed next to abutters, the Gatchels and the Couriers. So um, maybe as we discuss that, we might keep in consider keep considering that also. Um, since a lot of the other building envelopes fall within the 100 foot setback, personally I'm not that worried about that. I am a little concerned though with the driveway. Um, perhaps Maureen, you can say, does a 10 foot um, minimum from a property line apply in this situation? For instance, would the lot three driveway have to be 10 feet from the boundary of lot two? I'm going to have to look that up. I think it, it does, although this is a, a clustered subdivision and 
a lot of the de dimensional requirements um, are waived when you're going with a clustered subdivision. Okay, I'm still somewhat concerned with that with that access, and I want to make sure it's okay before we go much further with that. Um, let's see, with respect to the cul-de-sac issue. Our memo is suggesting that perhaps the homeowner, homeowners association be responsible for maintenance of the cul-de-sac, and I was curious what we do with respect to other cul-de-sacs in town that are landscaped. Typically, the town maintains them. Okay, and with respect to the roadway improvements at the entrance, there is a strip of land. I think it's to the northwest of the entrance. In through here. Who owns that? <coughs> For clarity to the board, the entire entrance area, my understanding is, including this area northwest of the entrance, is all town property right now. And any maintenance or upgrading of the entrance, as with the current entrance, mm -hmm. is through the maintenance agreement with the town from the association. And that's Maybe. your understanding, Maureen, that small rectangular lot near the entrance is town property. It's not labeled on the plan. Right, it is town property. I, I believe there's a, a somewhat interesting situation with 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 Stonegate in that um, the entrance area is 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 in the right of way, but is maintained by the homeowners association. Okay, I think again for the record, um, I know it's awkward with recall taking us halfway through, but typically developers provide that sort of landscaping. Um, they have the wherewithal, they have the staff on hand to put together landscape plans. I certainly would encourage them if they are amenable to something in general, the idea that they take more of the responsibility than just trying to pass it off to the homeowners association. Um, I think a lot of my other comments have more to do with a motion if we get that far tonight, so I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Judy. Tom? Yes. Um, on lot 17, what mechanism is going to define the back of um, the building envelope, that shaded area? Uh, this back in through here? Mm -hmm. That would be the same mechanism as is on any other lot in the subdivision. Simply the definition of the buffer is defined by the building envelope. But the building envelope, as I read it, um, well, there's really two, but the shaded area is not. The rear limit isn't defined on the plat plan. It's it's graphically indicated, but there's no dimension given or no bearing or anything that would allow one to locate that in the field other than scaling the drawing. We would be happy to put a bearing. I think, well, I guess let me back up on that. The bearing, none of these lots have actual meets and bounds descriptions of the uh, envelopes. And let me explain why. Mm -hmm. um, to do, I think that we discussed in the last meeting just briefly, to stake a building envelope in the field uh, or to put pins in our rebar mm -hmm. in from a surveying standpoint, from a practical standpoint, doesn't make a lot of sense. What you're basically doing in, in a, on a plan looks like one thing, but think about it in real life, that you've got a lot, you've got a lawn, you're, you're um, this particular lot here, you may have a uh, wooded edge that's somewhere in here for all, for all purposes. There's no reason to believe that every one of these building envelopes will be cleared to the limits as allowed. And to put pins or stakes in the middle of one's property, it just, it, it's confusing and doesn't make any sense. I understand your question. Um, we would be happy to, to put a dimension on there in relation to uh, any of the sidelines to further define that. That's, we have no problem doing that. I've, I've seen mechanisms like um, you know, no structures allowed beyond this line, a, mm -hmm. a, a setback. This is a unique situation because there are uh, properties abutting mm -hmm. uh, and their views would be impacted significantly. And this would appear to be a classical example of two neighbors could really uh, go after each other with a couple of foot error in interpretation of the plan. So it would seem to me a, a very good investment. If, if the intent is to have it parallel to the rear property line, the old rear property line of lot 49, and then some distance back, uh, I, would, I think that would help uh, We'd be happy to put during construction. On there. Uh, why was the uh, dimension of eight inches selected uh, rather than six or four or ten uh, for uh, under the clearing of the vegetation? I can't so answer that because I think that was done under the previous under Stonegate One. That mm -hmm. language is taken directly out of Stonegate One in terms mm -hmm. of the, the size. But let me refer you to your own ordinance, which which allows I can find the section which allows clearing of trees up to ten inch. Diameter. So basically, this entire restrict, uh, restriction on cutting is 
is already more restrictive than this than your town's ordinance. Okay. So I can find the chapter and verse I'll quote it to you. Would you describe uh, as an example where there's a drainage easement, for instance, between lots eight and nine, uh, what happens with a buffer in that example? <clears throat> Uh, it's, the, it's right at the end of the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. The language in the restriction, uh, the, the covenants and restrictions for the homeowners association allows for clearing within drainage ways, slope easements, uh, etc. Uh, utility for utility placement, driveway placement. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those conditions where uh, it is you are allowed to clear within the, the uh, utility easement. So would would a uh, would the buffer be? Uh, see, that's 15 feet. In essence, the bu if the buffer is measured from the property line, there would be no buffer uh, remaining if that were cleared for drainage. Isn't that a correct interpretation of the plan? That is correct on each of these lots here. Uh, I haven't looked at each one uh, in detail, but it would seem to me to be. Um, to be consistent with providing this buffering between, if that's the intent of the buffering, is to separate uh, properties and provide a sense of uh, privacy to uh, measure that 15-foot buffer uh, from the drainage easement line in the case where there are drainage easements going down a common property line. I believe the way the easement is now, there is 15 feet between the drainage easement and the existing buffer. The easement line is somewhere, I can't, I can't see from your, from your perspective, there. there's 15 feet between the edge of the easement and the edge of the proposed buffer, as a minimum in those cases. It, this, this, couldn't, this could not be cleared the full width. I believe this width is more like 60 feet, 70 feet. My, my guess would be that it may be 10 feet, that the side yard setback is 25. And if you take subtract, take away, subtract the 15 foot uh, easement, that would leave a 10 foot buffer. I'm sorry, I, guess you, I think you're right. I think you are right. Uh, I just think for the sense of con uh, sake of consistency, particularly where there is clearing in, the, in a, con uh, a common property line, it would be appropriate to maintain that 15-foot buffer. I see, I see no problem on either of those lots in doing that. We'd be happy to, I think, to increase the buffer on 8 and 9. Uh, one of the issues regarding the cul-de-sac at the last meeting was whether or not it was to be landscaped. Uh, where do we, where where do we come to that discussion at this point? With the cul-de-sac mm -hmm. island, we've we've called for three again white spruce trees, as shown on the, the plans on the uh, plan and profile sheets, okay. and the island itself to be vegetated with uh, loam and seed, uh, a mix on on the the grass area. Okay. I've discussed this again with the public safety and uh, with the highway department the issue of what they'll allow within the what they'd like to see within the cul-de-sac and their response is that they can maneuver their trucks around the center of the cul-de-sac and in addition to the center island what is more important to them at this point is that we allow a 10 foot a 10 foot outer edge of the cul-de-sac be loamed and seeded or grassed or somewhat level so they can get their trucks on it but I think that they, they still want mm -hmm. the option, my understanding is, of, of not having the entire center cluttered up should they have to utilize it. Okay. And I think that in our discussion at the last meeting, the idea of coming down the roadway and looking at the perspective of a, the cul-de-sac straight ahead, I think that the, the trees, the placement of those trees, uh, will all, those are eight-foot trees, mm -hmm. will adequately buffer the, uh, the view from the, the first two houses here coming down the cul-de-sac. I think that's an e excellent addition. There's nothing more distressing than going into a cluster development and suddenly finding oneself across a, quite a large expanse of asphalt like that. Um, I would agree with, with uh, Judy regarding the entrance uh, configuration, um, uh, excuse me, the entrance improvements at Mitchell Road, that it, the time to do it is really during the construction um, financing to make sure there's adequate money in there. And uh, that would be a lovely thing to see a detailed site plan of, but if that's something that uh, you can work out in, in uh, agreement with the Homeowners Association, and, and uh, I as a board member would, would certainly like to have an opportunity to take a look at it, um, but I know what's there now, and, and almost any improvement would, uh, would be an improvement. Um, so I, I would only suggest that, that uh, the, the proposed improvements, and I think the Homeowners Association has a pretty good idea of what they would like to see there, that those improvements be made part of the overall project and not something that comes afterwards. I 
more com are you through? Yes. Do we have any more comments from the board? Judy Larkin? Mm. I guess I have maybe two questions. Right now, does recall have enough votes on the homeowners association that they can make changes? Do they have at least 50%? I can't answer that question at this point. I, I really don't know. Really okay. Know. Well, the other one then is um, that issue of the strange lot up there was raised. What is what is recall going to do with it? The one that's not being donated to the town this, now. This parcel up here? Yes. This parcel will be dedicated uh, to the town as a conservation land along with the open space parcel A, a and B it is. So we'll see it on our final plans as such? Or? I think that could be accommodated. I, that's a, that's a qu good question for the final mm -hmm. plan level. I, whether this is actually, they do own that in fee at this point. Mm -hmm. Whether that can be shown on this plan if I well, it needs to be. I believe that's a separate parcel as it exists right now and wouldn't have to be. That's defined I don't, by I don't think you would necessarily have to show it on a plan as long as um, I think what we're hoping to get as part of the final plan approval is to get the deed to the land. The deed. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we have gotten the, the large plan that was prepared by land use that shows Dyer Pond and Stonegate mm -hmm. and includes this site. So we, we do have the meets and bounds of this lot already. Okay. Thank you. Um, the chair. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Lardner asked a question earlier about the, the, the driveway for lot three. Um, the requirement that you not allow a driver within 10 feet of another property line actually comes in under the site plan regulations. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to apply to this. However, you, you could probably pull it in under your subdivision requirements, but once you do that, the board can waive that. So if you're comfortable where the driveway is now, it doesn't necessarily have to be 10 feet away. Can I respond to just a couple of comments that were made, or are there more board comments? Um, if you'd like to respond now, why don't you? Just, just quickly, uh, the issue on lot three, again, one regarding the driveway is we've tried to accommodate as best as possible again the driveway location without getting too close to the wetlands, and that's why it's it's around five feet to the property line at the closest point. Uh, the the second issue here is the one of the setback from the wetlands in here to lot three. Uh, there's a suggestion, I, I admitted, and I apologize in my initial discussion uh, discussing this, is that that now is about at 70 feet at its closest point to the wetlands, which puts the building window as you see it in here. Although the building window on this lot is quite large, I think you can understand that the, the actual house location and siting, depending on where the builder would like to put it, will not obviously clear this entire area, it's simply allowing for a, a more flexible place from the home and, and, and drive and whatnot. And that I, I don't feel I agree with. Ms. Lardner's comment, and it was our same thought as well, that I don't think that extending this buffer to 100 feet when you walk in the field out there and look at what's going on serves any dramatic purpose other than to, on a planned view, have further buffer in terms of wildlife, in terms of protecting the wetlands, 70 feet versus 100 feet in this particular instance. I, I don't believe offers any greater uh, uh, protection of the wetlands, but it does at the same time, that extra 30 feet uh, in this area here where I would certainly place the house does begin to restrict the building window in this area and here in case the the homeowner wants to put the house closer to the, this lot line than the back the rear lot line so as the comment was made the further we push this setback in the further you're pushing your house back towards the uh, adjacent and butter so I would I would recommend that we remain with the 70 foot buffer from the wetlands along this edge here Thank you. I had just a few comments. Um, they've all been addressed for the most part. Um, the one was the, the lot 17 being changed is really, um, I really appreciated that. I wondered out of curiosity if there was any reason why you um, included it with lot 49 vis-a-vis -vis making it um, part of the conservation area. Just. I think what, from what Rachel's standpoint, was. that makes, I think, the land was there, it was already dedicated as a lot. It makes that a more saleable lot, offering okay. two and a half. It's not buildable, but I think the perception on the market is two and a half acre lot, the subdivision such as this, uh, is more marketable than, than a lesser lot. Okay. I had a question for our planner, which is, is there any need for us to reapprove the old stone gate because of the modification to the lots on that? Uh, the recording plot that's been presented by the applicant 
includes a note that that amendment to lot 17 slash lot 49 amends the prior subdivision approval. And that's, okay, that was one of my other questions. Uh, I had a question which probably, uh, I think you alluded to not really being sure, which was recall management being able to amend or become a part of the uh, Stonegate um, declaration, association, whatnot. From what I understand from the feeling from the public uh, hearing was that they wanted you to be involved with it and to be um, subject to the same conditions, but I wasn't sure technically or legally how you would go about it if you had actually assumed the developer rights and the developer rights would allow you to do that, in which case you're probably fine. I believe the way I understand that the documents and I've been through them is that, first of all, maybe you should back up one step, is that as a reminder, recall is very clearly not going to be the developer, very slim chance of being the developer. Recall takes properties, as we all know, to the FDIC, and they put those properties up for sale and, and try and get those properties on the market. Um, so they will not likely be the developer at the time. It would be sold to uh, a separate entity. would have to enter into agreement with the town in terms of accepting the letter of credit, et cetera, for final plan approval mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. So I, I believe in terms of the association, the documents allow for amendment uh, through there's a vehicle which, which allows for amendment in terms of changing lots in the subdivision, and number two, it allows for the addition of lots uh, through the, the uh, process, the, the voting process within the association, which requires a 67% vote to allow any of these changes. I believe, so I believe okay. the developer would take on those developer rights of the proportionate share I would, I would assume, with the association for the number of lots within Stonegate 4. Okay. I would only uh, comment that uh, I would want to make sure that, that this would be an unchallengeable um, amalgam, so to speak, mm -hmm. and even if our town attorney had to review it or, question, or just review the question of it, I just wouldn't want it to ever be thought that it could be separated again. Mm -hmm. uh, the entrance and the cul-de-sac I agree with the, um, you're taking care of those now. Um, I guess the cul-de-sac, I'm not sure. Um, there's been some thought about it being maintained if all the town maintains the other ones, but then again, perhaps the Homeowners Association should be involved with that. I have no particular feelings. I do see your point of view on the buffering um, for lot three, the, uh, the building envelope, I'm sorry. And you have addressed most, well, you've, you're, there are just some little house cleaning errors, I guess, on the plan, um, which was note four, drainage easement added to lot 51, and instead of a 20 foot five, 20 foot wide section of lot 49 it would be actually all of lot 49 to become a lot of part of lot 17. Uh, and a question for Maureen on uh, note 7 on the plan if you want to look at mine it's right here which was all construction activities on individual lots within 100 feet of the edge of the wetlands shall conform to the standards of DEP permit by rule. Could you explain that? For me. <laughs> DEP permit by rule, if you go up to, with, if you go within 100 feet of a wetland and you clear, you have to do it according to certain standards. If you go within 25 feet of the wetland, then you have to get an actual permit. Um, Rick, you may want to add to that. That's essentially correct. It does, what it does, does not allow, you cannot do any work within a wetland under a permit by rule. Therefore, by putting that note on there, it disallows anybody from doing any work within a wetland and, as Maureen said, within the buffer that would otherwise violate the permit by rule requirements. With the accept the permit by rule allows for utility crossings, utility connections, and, and things of the sort, but not for the type of activities that would go on with clearing of lots and whatnot. So that offers a level of protection on what can and cannot happen within 25 feet of a wetland. Okay. That really doesn't apply except just a couple of spots because you're really behind mm -hmm. more than 100 feet or 100 feet at least anyway. And uh, the last comment or, uh, that I had to make was relative to the, um, the clearing within the uh, buffer area. 
Um, and again, I see your point of view, and it would conform with the Stonegate um, existing declaration. I went through that fairly closely. But I think there's plenty of room still within the building of there's, these sites are enormous to make that pleasant transition from a cleared yard gradually into, uh, in the most case, fairly deep forest. So I would um, have you amend it if you're, when you do it within the um, declaration of covenants and restrictions, the particular conditions that would apply to Stonegate 4. Mm -hmm which you have already in, in, in your notes kind of made I think, I think we can to that. do that. Okay. Those are the end of my comments. Are there any further comments from the board? Tim Eichenberg. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask you about the Glad you asked. For my own refreshment, if, if not for the board as well. The, we have, the project has received a permit from the Corps of Engineers uh, for the filling, uh, again to back up a second, the filling required wetland alterations occur at the intersection here and a very minor amount right here at this portion of the road. The, again, the core permit has been issued. The DEP site location permit, well, we are working with DEP and we'll be submitting uh, upon preliminary approval these plans with the revisions that we've talked about tonight and those will be submitted to DEP for final approval. <coughs> And there's an issue that, not to beleaguer at this point, but there's an issue that was brought up earlier, just as a reminder, concerning the drainage and the off-site runoff with these uh, weirs in the stream on Stonegate 1. We have submitted a detail to DEP for their review and approval to take care of the comments addressing that. So basically, the, we expect to receive DEP approval probably the same time you would expect to receive with a little luck, uh, local approval. That is underway. Uh, under site law. Under site law. Do we have any other board comments? Does anyone want to wager a motion? <coughs> Judy Lardner. Madam Chairman, I propose the following motion for the board to consider. Findings of fact. <clears throat> One, recall management is proposing Stonegate Phase 4, a 17-lot subdivision which requires preliminary subdivision review, a wetlands alteration permit, and permit for construction in a resource protection zone. I'm making some modifications here. Two, the application for preliminary subdivision approval was deemed complete at the February 1990 planning board meeting. Three, the plan is subject to the requirements of Section 19-2-8, Resource Protection District of the Zoning Ordinance, in effect prior to May 9, 1990. Four, the applicant will be donating conservation land, pedestrian easements, and a right-of-way to the town which require legal documentation in accordance with Section 16-3-1, subsections O, J, and A. Five, Technical revisions to the plans are needed to comply with town road design standards in accordance, in accordance with section 16-3-1B. Six, clearly understood and readily available restrictions on the activities allowed outside the building envelope are needed to meet subdivision standards that protect landscaping, natural features, open space, and wildlife corridors in accordance with section 16-3-1 subsections C, O, and V. Seven, carefully designed building envelopes establish wetland buffers that protect wetland areas and mitigate wetland impacts in accordance with section 16-3-1U. Eight, the status and responsibility of the homeowners association with respect to phase four are not presently clear. Nine, a plan which depicts how the southerly entrance to Stonegate will be enhanced is necessary to review compliance with section 16-3-1C. And 10, the Stonegate Phase 4 subdivision substantially complies with the standards in the subdivision and zoning ordinances. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the information presented, the rest request of Recall Management Incorporated for preliminary subdivision approval, a wetlands alteration permit, and permit for construction in a resource protection zone for Stonegate Phase 4, a 17-lot subdivision located off of Stonegate Road be granted, subject to the following conditions. One, 
that easement, land donation, and right-of-way deeds be submitted prior to consideration of the final subdivision plan application. The final subdivision plan shall also clearly delineate the location of pedestrian easements and any wetland crossings. Two, that the plans be revised to reflect the changes recommended by the town engineer. Three, that the activities allowed outside of the building envelope be limited to installation of utilities, construction of driveways and septic systems, and removal of dead and diseased vegetation as determined by the code enforcement officer. Four, the side lot setbacks between lots eight and nine shall be increased to 30 feet on either side of the drainage easement, excuse me, on either side of the property line. Five, that note four on the recording plat shall be revised to reflect the reconfiguration of lot 17. Six, that the applicant shall either establish a separate homeowners association or demonstrate an agreement with the Stone Stonegate Homeowners Association to merge. Responsibilities of the association shall include maintenance of the Rock Crest Drive, cul-de-sac, and both Stonegate entrances. Seven, that a plan for the enhancement of the Southerly Stonegate entrance be submitted by the applicant after review by the Public Works Director. And eight, that all conditions shall be satisfied and evidence of approvals from all applicable state and federal agencies be submitted prior to application for final subdivision approval. Thank you. Do I hear it second? I have a comment. Uh, should we add in here the, uh, uh, that the plat plan should indicate uh, geometrically the rear building uh, mm -hmm. envelope on lot Very 17? Good. places where we have a common uh, lot with a drainage easement that would require the same 30-foot side yard setback? Six and five has a partial. <coughs> I'd be amenable to mimicking that language or including those two in that okay. condition. So it's clear to the board in case you missed it. I did eliminate the proposed condition four mm -hmm. that we had and substituted and then added several others. The only thing I would add as discussion would be um, on your condition six to establish either a separate homeowners association or demonstrate an agreement to merge would be, and I would presume it would happen anyway, that we have the um, review. If it turns out to be a separate homeowners association, that we re review it. I but I certainly hope you merge with the existing one. I believe under the, the subdivision ordinance, we have to uh, get approval from okay. town attorney and council. Get those documents anyway. Do you have something, Marie? Through the chair, um, you also yeah. have to come back for final subdivision approval, so you would be able to see it at that time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, through the chair to the planner, on item eight, in some cases, uh, state site location, for example, takes considerably longer than um, one is able to, uh, well, easily get through the local approvals process. Um, would it be reasonable to put in there either um, uh, have satisfied evidence of approvals or um, that the final uh, review uh, is contingent upon receiving DEP approval? Um, actually, I, yeah, I, I didn't have to propose that because a, su a submission requirement as part of your final subdivision review is the evidence of all approvals and it um, where the board could, in fact, be willing to accept something less than a final approval. In the past, the board has always required a, an applicant to come forward with that final approval from the state or the feds before coming back to the town and asking for final subdivision approval. 
Thank you. What? To my camera. Is that lot C the one on the top? Or what do you mean? The, uh, the open this is this as, is not designated on the plan. It is however designated in the by in the, in the deed and open space dedication. It includes this parcel here, so it's not dedicated as a parcel per se. If so, I mean, my my, uh, my question uh, concerns uh, condition one, which is the easement land donation. When we say land donation, are we including that lot? We are including that lot. Yes. Okay. I want to make sure that that's on the record. Thank you. It's an unnamed lot that we don't call it. <laughs> The funny unnamed lot that we're going to get, but it's not on the plan. That's the one. But it is described in the. Uh, it is described, and we know about it. Okay. <laughs> we have a second on this motion. Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hands. All those against, none. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Order of business is Kimball site plans. I welcome back Janet McKay and Stephen Etzel. Uh, it's Kimball site plans request by Robert Kimball for amendments to previous site plan approvals for a service and apartment building located at 300 302 Ocean House Road and a conversion of single family home to office space at 1235 Ocean House Road in accordance with section 19-29. We are looking for site plan completeness. Mr. Kimball, welcome back. Thank you. A brief resume, if you will. Um, as, I, as you mentioned before, what we're trying to do here is um, on 300 302 Ocean House Road, we're trying to convert an existing space into a residential use that was once used, uh, utilized commercially. Um, in the 1235 Shore Road, we're trying to convert it to a strict residential use into an office space. Um, and I hope that we do have a complete application. I'm not sure of that yet. Okay, in this case, I might, um, ask Maureen, if you would, to go over any issues that we still might feel are outstanding here. There have been some. I'm, I'm wondering if I could do one thing also. Um, yes. While we're reviewing this, I'm wondering if I could just give um, something, um, some pictures, a little bit of the history of the building of uh, 300 Ocean House Road, just to show some pictures depicting what it looked like uh, previously and what it is now, and some of the um, different things that we've done to the building. Could I just leave that with the same? Yes, you want to finish and then you can pass it around. <coughs> And that's just going to be, I think it would be useful for some of the planning board members that don't, haven't lived here since 1986. Um, the memo in front of you included as attachment one is the uh, summary site plan review submission checklist. What I'll do is just uh, go briefly over the items that have been indicated are um, partially complete or incomplete at this time. Uh, and if I skip anything, just stop me and ask questions. Uh, but going down the list, down to 6C, uh, the applicant is required to show the, the dimensions of proposed driveways. Um, there are existing driveways on the site with which the applicant proposes to continue to use. Um, 
the driveways are, are gravel and they vary in width and there's one width that's been provided but not actual widths along showing you the maximum width and the minimum width but that's been identified as a possible incomplete item. Um, going down to number 10, uh, I'd like to refer to the comments from the town engineer. He has several concerns regarding the present design of the parking lots. Uh, the town engineer's comments are included as, as attachment two. Um, most of the comments revolve around questions about whether people will actually be able to pull into the parking lot, turn around, and be able to leave again um, without hitting something. Um, under 12A, uh, the town engineer has requested additional information regarding stormwater on the Lot 79 driveway. I believe at this time that, that the, the Lot 79 driveway is the Sheer Madness building and the applicant is not proposing to pave that at this time. I did speak with the Public Works Director this afternoon and he stated that if that driveway were to be paved, it would probably create an icing problem at that intersection since the gravel supposedly will be absorbing some of the water whereas a paved driveway would uh, cause some sheet flow onto Shore Road. Um, under 12B, the town engineer has also requested additional information related to wastewater generation, um, sewer connection details, the, the house on Lot 80, which is to be connected to the sewer system. There are no details right now that show how it's connected. Currently, it's being served by a septic system, um, which uh, apparently sits somewhere in the area underneath the parking lot behind the house. Um, under number 13, uh, it's a landscaping question. The applicant is not proposing any additional landscaping at this time. However, there are some questions about whether, whether the existing landscaping on the site, primarily large trees, uh, how they will be preserved through any kind of construction process. There really isn't a preservation plan uh, that's been submitted. In addition, the town engineer has recommended that um, since the gravel lots appear to be expanding, uh, there definitely will be some disturbance of vegetation and there's nothing right now in the plans that talks about loaming and seeding of any areas that are going to be disturbed. Maureen, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, if I could ask a question. Under 13 uh, landscaping buffering plan, is this a section where um, treatment of, of any slope from potential uh, or uh, possible regrading of the, the parking lot, the treatment of the, the increased slope, would that come under this? Um, in terms of erosion control mm -hmm. treating the slope, you could bring it under this. You could also bring it under um, the stormwater information that's being requested under 12A okay. because erosion control and stormwater are very closely related and usually are dealt with simultaneously. Any other questions at this no. point? No. Thank you. Okay. Um, under number 14, the applicant has provided uh, catalog cuts of proposed lighting fixtures. I just wanted to point out to the board that the, the rear of the Sheer Madness building is proposed to have a, a floodlight which has no shield around it and there's a very good possibility that that light is going to be spilling off, off of that property onto the abutting residential properties. Um, under number 15, the applicant has submitted uh, sketches of the signs that are proposed for each of the buildings. Um, there are certain, certain triggering points in the site, the sign ordinance in terms of size and I've, I've looked it over with the code enforcement officer and making some assumptions it appears that this, that the signs that are proposed will not trigger any of those maximum limits. The only thing we still need to know is how high the wall sign on the Sheer Madness building will, will be because there's a maximum height in the ordinance of 20 feet so we need some evidence that it's not going to be mounted any higher than that. Um, and the last item, the, the plans have been stamped by a registered surveyor. However, uh, if the board recalls from the last meeting, there was a letter from the town attorney that referred to the proposed easements and then the, the, the revisions that were needed to be made to those easements and that his comments have not been addressed at this time. Are there any questions? Judy Lardner. I'm going to bring up an issue right now and if it's appropriate to discuss it later. <coughs> That's fine. Uh, we have another item on our agenda at the end of the evening, the Scott House site plan. And when I looked at this and then looked at the other one, I couldn't help but think there's a major connection here. And given that the town is now working on, you know, town center planning, 
I think there's some issues that go beyond the site plan, and I don't know when those should be brought up. I have, I have concerns and suggestions, but I don't know when, because we're not doing substantive review right now. But I'd like to get into those before we get too far into this. Is there any suggestions? I, Steve? I'm sure. Um, I guess along with that, that question, it's still not clear, um, although perhaps it should be clear from the first paragraph of our notes. It states that the applicant is, is elected to request a new site plan, and that, I guess my question, this is no longer an amendment to the first site plan, um, and that we're treating this as one site, is that correct? So, Mayor, I guess I, I want to, I would like the, the applicant to confirm this, but it is my understanding that this was to be a combined new site plan, and for that reason, there was no um, specific list of changes to the existing site that was requested from the applicant. Um, so there's, there's two options. Either you could go with trying to amend your previous approvals, in which case we really do need a specific list of everything that needs to be amended, or to just present this as a brand new site plan, in which case we just look at what's on the face of the earth right now. And I, I uh, guess through the chair, um, you may want to ask the applicant <coughs> if, if, which approach you want to take? I would, I would ask you with my own um, feeling, which is that as far as my consideration so far that this is a new application and that I'm not trying to amend to other ones, but why don't you tell me what we should be doing here, you think we're doing? Um, whichever one would expedite the process, I guess. <laughs> no. Um, I think we ought to look at it probably as um, as a new site plan review, but I would only ask that they take into consideration that, you know, at, the, at one point in time this was approved and we're not changing anything that drastic. Um, I'd just like that to be, you know, to be in the back of their minds. I, I think they can look at the, the whole site plan as something that would good because what was happening before is everything that we we're doing now we haven't changed the thing we're not changing what we're asking for um, but one thing was changed so I guess we'll look at it as a new site plan okay. uh, that, uh, is, is, go ahead I, I, Steve, I I'd hope you could make it more clear than that I mean we'll look at it as a new site plan okay as far, as, far as I'm concerned as of right now why don't we say this is a new site plan and we're going to look at it as two just separate as two separate properties, though? No. I don't... I see them as two separate properties in common ownership, which makes them not perhaps exactly two separate properties, but perhaps not exactly one complete. Okay, because there um, isn't one complete? Because there's, there are things that we may want to consider because they're in common ownership. But they are in full common ownership, not. though because there are other people that own the white building with me. Okay, that's the oh, thing. Oh, that's right. You have, have a, we have a, a small there. distinction. In so there. we have to keep them as two separate business entities. We can't con consolidate them into one because there's other, other people involved. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Uh, I think we need, as, as a board, need to either look at this as one new site plan of one site or a new site plan of two separate sites that, that have easements on each other. Um, what we have before us is, is a single site, site plan comprising of two lots, but it's, it is one site plan approval. Okay, I agree with you on that. Okay. Um, yeah. so it, it would seem to me that it, it should be extremely clear as to whether or not it's one or two lots. Either it is or it isn't. And from what I've heard, it's two lots. Otherwise, there wouldn't be easements required for uh, maneuvering and so forth. I don't mean Mr. to get okay. too yeah. technical about this, but who was it that filed the application in this case? Was it the owner of 79 and the owner of 79 and 80, or was it one or the other? I mean... It was the owner of one lot and the co-owner of another lot, as I understand it. Is that, that's the way the ownership is. Well, you own... One alone, and then one with a co-tenant. Yeah. With a co-owner. Uh, 
Well, it's, it's sort of peculiar to have two owners and two lots and one site plan application. So I guess that's why we're confused, or at least that's why I'm confused. <coughs> okay. Um, are we treating that was probably, it as one? That was probably my mistake. Are, are we, but, but as I understand it, you want us to treat it as two applications that are happening at the same time that happen yes. to be located next to each other. Yes. Two applications. Well, I see it. I, I see it as one application, one site that's presented by two common owners. And so you can't be two common owners because there are other people involved in the sheer madness building. I mean, I I I I, I couldn't okay put it as one site plan because there are other people involved in the white building. Madam Chair, um, Mr. so they're two separate, we're, we're dealing with two separate lots with one site plan. They're two separate lots because there is a boundary line and they are set, lot 79, they're both mapping. Do I, I don't think do we that. can take action on, on somebody else's, in, else's interest. If, if we go down to, to, to number 16, evidence of right title and interest of the property to be reviewed, what I'm hearing is there are other co-owners who are not joining as applicants in this one site plan review. Mr. Kimball, are you the general partner of a partnership that owns the other lot? Yes, I'm the two-thirds owner. And control the controlling interest. interest. Yes. Ms. Lart, uh, Judy Lard, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, my, my original point in getting this going is I'm not trying to split one or two. I'm trying to turn these two lots into three. <laughs> I think as planners we have to do that if we can because I mean, frankly, my point is, I think there should be a joint parking lot for three properties here, and I don't know how to achieve that. I don't know if that means going to the town council, um, just asking three property owners to get together, because first off, let me say, I'm really excited what's happening on these three properties. I think it's really appropriate. Um, the Sheer Madness building has been a lot of improvements done. It looks great. I think a commercial or business use in the next building makes sense. The fact that the scout house was not torn down is wonderful. The fact that the parking is going behind the buildings is fabulous. And we could go further to make it really a good deal. But as I look now, and I'm getting a little substantive, and I look at the standards, I don't think you can meet them. So I'm kind of torn because I think it could be very innovative something we can be proud of but as it stands now I I hate to even go forward with this because I'll have negative comments does that make sense Judy I, I would agree with that um, I think that's what we were so confused about at the last meeting just trying to deal with that very issue and, and we're only looking at two lots it would seem to me without getting into any sub substantive issues that some coordination between property owners if there is a common interest which there appears to be because they're sharing the same entrance drive uh, if they aren't physically connected because of the, the very issue that you have two separate properties, but they are able to interconnect uh, and there's some easement or some other mechanisms for doing that, I think that would go a long way to doing what Judy is suggesting. And I think what it would do in your case is help clean up uh, your parking lot, which is now a lot of it's dedicated to circulation uh, and inefficiency, and I think would help businesses and, and, and make the layout of your properties work a, a little better there are a lot of but there are a lot of other issues that are involved here first of all if you want to take the yellow building and incorporate all the parking for the yellow building and the white building together okay first of all the topography is going to make that very difficult because the retaining wall on the sheer madness building is at an elevation so it wasn't so gaudy and it didn't look like some of this big obstruction in the middle of nowhere because it would have had to come up to about the top of the back roof mm -hmm. of the flat part of the building and if you looked at that from Jonesy's point of view he'd look at that and then what what the heck is this monstrosity that's seven seven foot eight tall so we kept that down okay for that very reason so then uh, if you try to blend the two properties what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of watershed running towards the retaining wall which could impair the structural integrity of that, of that wall. That's why we're trying to keep it separate. Uh, because at the point right now, it's gonna be extremely difficult to do. The other thing is, what about the liability issues that are, that are raised when you have a consolidated property, okay, with two separate owners, okay, 
and they're all parking on and they're passing in through each other's <coughs> through each, each other's property who assumes what liability say if you want you were someone was coming into sheer madness and you wanted them to use you, you're stating that you want us to use the driveway between Virgilio and the yellow building and they drive up and the person walks out of the yellow building and gets hit by a car coming into sheer madness who's responsible who's who's going to assume the liability in terms of the um, in terms of the property owner this is where yeah. there's some confusion if I think that's why I want to keep them as separate business entities. You know, and the only thing we're doing right now is we're actually just sharing a small portion of the driveway, of the, of the beginning of the driveway, the entrance of the driveway. And that's what we're trying to, trying to achieve and make that run as smoothly as possible between the yellow building and the scout house. Okay, I'm going to take Janet McKay and then I'm going to make a comment. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to hear you two say. <laughs> Mr. Kimball, I don't pretend to be an absolute expert in this kind of thing, but let me tell you how I understand the um, uh, Cape Elizabeth regulations are set up at the present time. Uh, if we have, is it lot 79 that has the white house on it? Is that what we're saying? Yes. yes. And then 80 has the yellow, yellow house. and then the scout house is the next one over and that's Mr. Virgilio's. Yes. Um, if the owner of lot 79 and the lot and the owner of lot 80 were not connected in any way didn't happen to have you as the person who owned a controlling interest in one and all of another those two adjacent and abutting owners could get together and if they wanted to no obligation and file a what would amount to a joint application for a site plan that would cover lot 79 and lot 80. If they wanted to, three owners who were abutting owners who voluntarily wanted to get together, even though there were no common ownership, could get together and file a joint application that would be one site plan that the board would look at that would apply to all of the properties. I think that as far as easements go, you would have um, strict documentation about who had easements over what, and there would be burdening easements and there would be favorable easements. With respect to the insurance point of view, I think you can, um, your, your concern for liability is certainly a valid one. Uh, I believe that you ought to be able to uh, cover that by insurance if you have the cooperation of all of the the lot owners. I think what, the, what I understand the board is trying to say at this point is that it really is your decision in the first instance about whether you're going to be the owner of lot 79 bringing forward lot 79 and nothing else and some kind of controlling interest in 80 and bringing that forward and nothing else and um, for whatever reason, and I'm not trying to comment on that, um, if you decide that it's not to your advantage to explore um, potential relationship with the butters, then there's nothing that we can do about that. Uh, I guess what I would like to suggest to you is that the town has, in the last two years, I think in particular, um, tried to look quite seriously at the town center and what we might do in order to make it a better place. Uh, there's a town center planning committee or something now. I don't know uh, what's going on with that, but um, I suppose what I'd like to do is urge you to consider at least consulting with Mr. Virgilio if you thought that was at least uh, something you could possibly consider doing to see if it made sense to try to, to um, set forth a combined something that would affect all three properties. If you look at it and decide it just, you know, it won't work for whatever reason, then fine. You should, you should bring back to us whatever it is that you think is in your best interest. But I guess at this point, what, what I have before me is one site plan and two affecting two parcels that you're telling me as I understand it you're telling me you want me to consider separately and if that's the case I think you have to go back and give me two site plans um, that's the way I would read it at this point 
Thank you, Janet. I'm taking it back even further one step. If this is a joint application, which is how I'm considerate, for these two properties, then I'm considering both of them together. They may be in separate ownership, but it's a joint application, and they're on one plan. What we have before us is application completeness. That's all that's right here before us right now. We're not discussing anything else. Uh, there is, I'm sure on the board, an enormous amount of interest in why this can't be looking a different way or having some other things explored. But that's not what we're doing right this moment. If we get beyond application completeness, agreeing that it is a joint application of however you want to say it, of two properties, which we will be considering just as we see it here, then I think we take a vote on application completeness and go from there and get start giving you comments as to beyond that. Okay. But let's go one step at a time. Okay. In which case, with regard to application completeness, do I have any further comments? I, I would say that we've had some, oh, excuse me, Madam Chairman, but I'd yes. say since we've had the layout from our town planner with respect to what we consider to be the portions which are not complete, perhaps we could hear from the applicant about whether or not uh, there's anything else that we need to consider in that or whether he has anything to say. Thank you. Do you have anything more to say with re reference to those items? I don't, so um, do we have some comments from the board, or shall I just wrap okay. myself? Mr. Ethel. Excuse me, I think probably the toughest thing for me to do to, uh, to look at and I try to focus on the completeness issue and where I keep getting hung up in this plan as it exists. Um, I'm sorry, as it exists, it is, is the parking layout in the comments by the, by the town engineer. Uh, in looking at this myself, I can't see how some of those sites work. Um, I, I, there, there are two issues. The, the functional flow of, of traffic and the utility of each site, e each parking spot, and um, the representation uh, on the site plan of the, of the elevation, um, in my opinion, just it isn't complete. I, I can't see that there. Uh, I, I guess perhaps I don't know how to, to express it uh, appropriately, there, but when I look at this and, and I see the contours um, not being um, affected by what are now, I'm told, gravel um, parking spaces, um, it does not give me a good sense of what the what the final plan will be. If this is what the final plan is, I, I could tell the, the applicant that one board member, I, I'd have a difficult time making a decision on the, on the parking, just the parking for itself. Uh, I would like to see um, some treatment because we are considering this uh, two sites in the downtown area, uh, in the village center area, um, some treatment of pedestrian flow, um, and I, I'm. I'd, turn to the planner to see where that, under what item in the checklist uh, uh, that would fall under. But uh, we have a prime opportunity here for um, improving the, 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 the flow of, of uh, pedestrian uh, traffic uh, in front of these two sites. I guess the, the, the driveway issue, again, is uh, uh, unclear to me in, in the representation on the plan. Um, I, I'm not sure I can then give specific uh, references to what I would like to see as complete. I would propose uh, that as one site plan, um, some explanation of the proposed turning radii of the parking spaces, how, how the applicant intends for those to work. Uh, at, uh, almost all of the sites uh, in the northern um, end of the, of the two sites together need some explanation of how they're going to work. Okay. Ms. McKay? 
Did you? I guess just to move the um, proceeding along, I'd be happy to make a motion at this point, if you thought it was in order. Well, I'd right. like to get it moving. That would be my... I'd at least like to get beyond step A. the town attorney. Information that needs to be added to the plan, information that needs to be presented. Okay, what would the information that would need to be added to the plan be specifically? Um, everything in the memo, I believe you got a copy of it. Yeah, I'm looking at it right here. Right. Everything what would that listed be specifically, under certification. Though? You know, I may be able to well, visually describe what I'm trying to get across here and that may gratify people you know, sitting on the board. I, I believe there are also items that the town engineer requested to be submitted in plan form. Um, details, plan profiles of the driveways. Um, there were easement deeds that were requested from the town attorney. I, I, I don't mean to mm -hmm. speak for the board, but I think those things would need to be submitted in advance and reviewed. I don't recall the town engineer ever asking for a plan, a profile for a driveway on the previous. No, it's of the sewer. Letter. Yep. Do you have um, the town engineer's letter? Yes, right in front of me. Madam Chairman, if, if I could Mr. just back up for a minute. Um, I have a feeling that if people are watching at home, this is a classic example of what people see as a bureaucratic disaster, that someone comes in <laughs> who's renovated two houses, they come in, they've got gravel parking lots, they want to put or push around a little gravel, put up a couple of signs and go home and, and be left to do their business. Um, unfortunately, what we have here is a, is a significant opportunity to do more than that. And at the same time, we have an applicant before us. We have town standards that we as a board have to address. And I think from that standpoint, the letter that you have from the town planner and the engineer's comments address quite specifically the information that's necessary to make the app application complete. In addition to that, we have other substantive issues that need to be addressed, which we can't address at this time because the, the application has to be deemed complete before we move to that next step. Yeah, well. um, and unfortunately, even though it's a small project, small projects have as many design issues to deal with, as many technical issues to deal with. They still have four corners, they still have buildings and all the rest. So it seems extraordinarily complex for a small project, but just keep in mind that, it, that it's an important project. And I don't think the time to, to debate the, the comments from the town planner and the engineer is in this form or try to explain them away uh, to us. I think they're, they're very clear that they haven't been met in the application. And I would just reinforce this, this question about easements. Easements seem to be extremely important to the viability of this project, particularly since we're hearing that it's two lots, not one that's being merged. And I would, for one, suggest that those easements be indicated on the site plan itself, not as a separate document. It's uh, very congested to do that. It's almost but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. It, but if some, someone picks up a site plan and, and, and this other easement document isn't anywhere to be found, uh, in a future sale of the of the uh, yeah, property. Yeah, that's going to be done. That's going to be all recorded at the registry of deeds. Well, you can do it any way you want mm -hmm. to. I'm just I'm just giving you my concerns and and. Uh, okay. And and you have the concerns of the planner and, and the and the town engineer. Ms. Lardner. Thank you. Um, some ways I feel like I shouldn't say this since I opened the whole can of words on the completeness issue, but my view on completeness is always that the items that are um, indicated in the ordinance um, as being required, not on the planner's checklist or not what the engineer usually requires, is what the applicant has to submit. They can be woefully inadequate and you know, you can say you're, you're way off base, but in my mind, if it's submitted, it's complete and in my mind this is complete. I raised the issue before because I, I hate to even go forward when I think we have a big issue in front of us, but if we're dealing with this specifically, um, I would disagree that these issues are completeness, personally. I think, um, well, 
for instance, dimensions of proposed driveways. There is a dimension of proposed driveway. There's no requirement there be numerous dimensions of the driveway. I don't think you can hold up somebody on that. Um, the engineer has concerns. There is a location of the town sewer. What it asks for is that the location and design of existing and proposed stormwater systems, sanitary waste disposal systems, the potable water supply, and methods of solid waste storage and disposal. I think one can legitimately argue that you didn't really know what you mean by design, that you needed sections and so forth. Um, let's see, additional information in stormwater, that is additional. It's not some information. It's, it's something other and above what the application is, um, the applicant has provided. Um, there's no ex requirement for a detailed and explicit preservation plan and so forth. So I would like the board to consider that if we're talking about completeness. I'm one of those people who's very conservative on that definition. I think we have a heck of a lot of issues to deal with on this application, though, and I might be extremely liberal in my interpretation of those, so for what it's worth. Thank you, Judy Lardner, very much. Do we have a motion? I think I have, a motion. I have a motion unless someone wants to pick up further on what uh, Judy Gardner has just said. The only thing I would add is that I think that's exactly where I am. I feel that we should, there's enough here to start with. I want to get beyond the stumbling block and go on from there. Uh, there are some, perhaps some conditional things in here, but I don't. I just wanted to refer to the ordinance. It is my um, memory that there is no required timetable for site plan ordinances similar to what you have with the subdivision ordinance. So you are required to deem the application complete before you um, begin discussing the merits of the project. But there is no timetable for how long you have once you deem something complete in order to um, act upon it. Ms. McKay. I'd like to move that be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Robert Kimball for site plan review of the addition of an apartment for a total of three apartments and a service establishment at 300 to 302 Ocean House Road and second, the conversion of a single family home to 2,200 square feet of office space at 1235 Shore Road be deemed incomplete for the reasons set forth in the town planner's memorandum uh, dated March 17, 1992. Second. We have any discussion? All those in favor of the motion is on silent. As a non-voting member, I urge the board to vote against that motion. <laughs> I, I would just like to pick up on Ms. Lardner's comment. Um, I think one of the most difficult things we have to do as board members on the site plan review is to stay away from substantive review when we're dealing with issues of completeness. And this is an extremely unusual uh, project. Uh, and I, as I think Judy said, I'm very uh, anxious to get to the next step. Um, and I would be, I would be very Typically, I wouldn't deem this a complete application, but I'd be very willing to deem it complete in order to get to that next step because there are such substantive issues to be discussed. Or I would be willing to do as we've done in the past to, um, I guess, deem it complete and, and uh, refer it to the next meeting contingent upon receipt of the outstanding issues in the memo. I think that's an appropriate way of proceeding as a compromise, a compromise to the applicant. That, okay. We have a second. We've had discussion. I think we go now to a vote. 
I would just like to say before we vote that I don't enjoy the position of playing the heavy particularly, <laughs> uh, but I do feel more and more strongly as I spend more time on this board that um, we do ourselves and the applicant uh, a disfavor, if that's a proper term, um, by accepting six or seven conditions if there's one or possibly two things that are lacking but the applicant has clearly fulfilled every other whatever I'm willing to consider making some kind of an exception but here we've got uh, you know 6 C 10 12 A 12 B 13 15 and 16 and I would like to have a what I would deem a complete application before me so that I can go on to the substantive issues and because the issues are substantive if anything that makes me want to insist more on a complete application before I go to the next step rather than having to deal with two things at the same time thank you rebuttal to that point if I may <laughs> um, as one board member who does believe the application is complete the um, flip side of what Janet was just saying is that we will if the board votes that it's incomplete the applicant goes home and he makes these changes and he comes before next time and you can be damn sure that we're going to tell him he's got to go back and make a lot of changes so to me it's a formality that this application will be changed I, I think it has to for any number of reasons if the board can find in your heart or in your mind that it's complete I think it makes more sense to make that finding now and give seems to me give more direction to the applicant before cha changes are made I know this is not a really involved site plan I don't know that it would cost a fortune for to make him go back and make changes and make him come back again but I really do believe according to our ordinance it's complete so I'd like you to consider that before you vote thank you <coughs> Mr. Sure. Um, I, I guess my concern is, is, in my understanding, is almost any time during the process we can ask for more information. Um, I just think we're starting from pretty low down on the ladder uh, for a starting place, I mean, and I really don't think that the, the applicant should uh, uh, look at the application being deemed incomplete uh, as holding up this plan. Uh, there's a lot of information that's going to need to be piled through here. Uh, I'm just uh, saying uh, if we can give this direction of just those items that are, are mentioned in the uh, memorandum of uh, 6, 3, 6 C through 16, um, I, I think we just did a better starting place. Um, I, I don't think there's any loss in time by deeming this incomplete thing. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Well, we have a motion before us, which has been seconded and discussed. We'll vote on it and go from there. All those in favor of the motion is read. Signify by raising your right hands. Three. Opposed. Two. The motion passes. Three to two. The, uh, the application is deemed incomplete. I guess I'd like to suggest that if Mr. Coleman or Mr. Kimball have any questions about what's set forth in the memo that they contact the town planner. Thank you.
The next application before us under new business is the Skilling Subdivision Amendment. Request by Larry Skillings for review of a subdivision amendment constituting swapping of land between abutters located in the vicinity of 427 Mitchell Road in accordance with section 16-2-5 of the subdivision ordinance. Do we have the applicants before us? Would you please come up and identify yourself? Yes, my name is Larry Skilling. Good evening. Do you want to explain for our viewing audience just a bit of what we're doing here? Well, basically, all it is is a, an even exchange of property. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what I want is a little more frontage in my house, and I would give him the same amount of square footage on his sideline property. Um, and the reason for this is uh, because on the front of my house, I'm looking at his driveway in the back of his house, which is just a blank wall, and he parks all his vehicles and so forth out there. And basically what I want to do is just kind of put a little buffer zone in between our houses, which he 100% agrees on. I'm just going to put it back into its original state uh, before the properties, uh, the houses were built. There was a lot of trees and so forth taken down, and I just like to put uh, shrubbery and trees and a little split rail fence back in between our houses. So a a actually what it is is just uh, um, a land exchange, the same amount of square footage. Okay. Ms. Kay. Yes, Mr. Skillings. I um, certainly have no difficulty with the theory of what it is that you're trying to do, and I noticed that both uh, families were on the application, and it made an awful lot of sense to me that you would agree to redraw the common boundary. What I can't figure out, and maybe there is some easy explanation for it that I'm just missing, uh, in the note we have before us, I guess we all have a, a new version of the plan that mm -hmm. would presumably correct some of the typographical areas, errors and whatnot. Uh, the notes say that the existing area of lot two is 41,983 square feet and then it has the proposed new area and it goes up another uh, say 1100 square feet it's an increase so far so good the existing area then the note number two says the existing area of lot number one is 48,424 square feet and then it talks about the proposed new area and that goes up by 1100 square feet now that's a wonderful deal if you can do it uh, I but, can, I uh, can. I can explain that. Okay. <coughs> As you can see, the right of way coming in yeah. is 50 feet wide. Well, that's owned in common between the Blakos and myself. So when F.S. Plummer laid these lots out, and after we built our houses, as you can see, my driveway and his driveway, I have a blacktop driveway, which is approximately oh, 15 to 20 feet on the right of way owned in common. And his driveway, a stone driveway, uh, is approximately the same on the right of way. So what we want to do is just deed that section of the driveway, which is on the right of way, to I want to deed my section to him. Theoretically, I could park my vehicles in his driveway. You see what I'm saying? So what is owned in common, we're just going to take a small section of that, and I'm going to deed my section to him, and he's going to deed his section to me. So we'll own our driveways. <laughs> and the rest of it, where our two driveways intersect, from there on out to the main road will be left in common. And so that's, that's why actually we're getting more square footage. I see what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other? Mr. Etzel? Um, I noticed that this, this plan is a portion of the FS Plumber Company Inc. property on Mitchell Road. On the new plan, it, it, it identifies as one of the abutters is, is Hobstone, which is an FS Plumber uh, property. Uh, the old plan doesn't have that on there. Are these two lots part of the Hobstone condominium? Uh, <clears throat> I believe, uh, the town plan, I, mean, I believe it was at one time, uh, I think Bayer owned this. I don't believe it did belong to Hobstone. My, my question is, is based uh, on the fact to the... Uh, you mean when uh, F.S. Plummer bought the property? Well, no, I mean, <clears throat> we're dealing with, with uh, exchange and some property 
which appears to be two lots that are part of a subdivision. Am I correct, Maureen? And I was just wondering what subdivision that is that we're dealing with. How many total lots are there that we're dealing with? We have an, an unlabeled lot, which would be in the um, southerly corner, um, going south on Mitchell Road. We have the Cormier lot. Then, then south of the 50-foot right of way, we have what appears to be a lot, but I'm not, I'm not sure who the owner there is. And, and it isn't a butter on one of these, granted, a very small section, 34 and a half foot section of land, it's an abutter to that. Is that part of the subdivision, this lot? No, that isn't. Okay. No, that isn't. Who is the owner? Do you know? Um, uh, I can't remember her last name. I don't recall her name. I, I, another question I have is, is uh, it, it does state in here owned the, that this common driveway is owned in common by lots one and two per locust deed. Um, are we, are, Maureen, are you fairly well um, feel the, the certain that there are no other, uh, no other owners in common of this 50-foot uh, right away? Um, I, I have not done any research into this. I'm relying on the fact that this has been stamped by a registered surveyor in the state of Maine and the fact that he stamped it and has done the research on it. That's what I'm relying on. Truth is that you concur with that uh, from a title point of view, if there were uh, 15 other owners in this? Uh, I know for a fact. Well, we, I'm sorry. We don't have to do. I know for a fact yeah. that it's just the Blakos and I that own this property, this right away. <coughs> and on that answer, Steve, um, there's a reference down below, plan of a portion of F.S. Plummer Co. Inc. property on Mitchell Road, Cape Elizabeth, dated and recorded. Hmm. There's substantial documentation as to what that subdivision is. I think it may just be an unnamed subdivision, which is called Plan of Land of. That's what it looks My like to me. Was, you know, are, are, are there any other people that, that have an interest in the subdivision that, that uh, have been notified? I think, and I'm not really trying to, well, to belay this, I think there is this a, a very equitable uh, uh, mm -hmm. exchange of, of property. I just want to know, that make sure that there's no other people that we should be giving consideration to. No, here. there is not. Maureen? Uh, would you? Through the chair, I would like to let you know that there was a notice sent to all abutters and people. Uh, Twenty-five notices were sent out to the to people within the area. So, hopefully, if there is someone who's interested who was an abutter, they should have received a notice regarding this. Do you have a date of when that was sent out? That was sent out uh, one week ago tonight. Could I ask a yeah, question? I'm sorry. I'm right. um, thank you. Uh, there seems to be an issue here in the engineer's uh, memo about the uh, existing house now having a 20-foot setback and that not meeting the uh, existing uh, requirement. Would this not need a uh, review by the zoning board? Okay. Uh, yeah, zoning Ms. O'Meara can answer that, I believe. Uh, actually, the, the purview, the interpretation of the zoning ordinance is the purview of the code enforcement officer. He has reviewed this, and this is in an RC zone with the side setback of 20 feet. So he feels it is compliance with the zoning ordinance. So the town engineer's <coughs> comment is incorrect. Correct. Correct. <laughs> right, correct. That's right. <laughs> okay. I apologize for that. I, I'm having a hard time in this job doing what I used to do, which was read this stuff as well as try to run the meeting and listen to everybody. So I, I well, That's all right. It. I was stumbling as to whether to call you Madam <laughs> Chairman or Chair Unit or whatever. So. <laughs> Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I like that. Madam Chow. Um, um, do we have any other comments from the board? Judy Lardner. Question to the applicant. I assume it would not be any problem for you to submit a copy of the locust deed for the right-of-way showing ownership. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be any problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the only other question I had, and uh, I, it's a matter of form, but um, I don't think it's inappropriate, would be that that parcel of land on the south side of the right-of-way just be labeled as to ownership. All the others are. And I'm not a 
Okay, that leaves us kind of in a funny spot here. Um, if I may summarize, I, I think there, that the board um, is in concurrence that um, this subdivision um, lines be realigned uh, with the exception of two small things, which are the um, propo bringing in a copy of your deeds, and uh, particularly the deed to the right-of-way, and the addition of the um, notation on the plan, which I understand will be recorded and has to be signed by the, the planning board. Um, I'm kind of stuck, I guess, Maureen. Is this, is this, excuse me, is this a copy of the plan that we are signing? Yes, it is. is. It's That's intended? a copy of the plan that you could sign. Because Tonight. It, um, it doesn't have complete uh, geometrics on, on the property line at all. On the, With uh, respect to the changing property lines, it does. Which is, you know, which is all that's germane here, I believe. Um, in my opinion, all of the property lines are germane on the parcel that's being affected. Otherwise, we don't know what happens on the other side of the property. You're referring to the south, very southerly. Well, not southern so much that as I'm talking about the uh, northerly side of uh, the applicant's um, property line. Do, are you? you do you, you mean it's, that it's the bearing isn't there? I mean, the bearings aren't you know, there. It's uh, would you explain that? Uh, on uh, on the line that's uh, your uh, <coughs> northerly property line, it's labeled 355.5 feet plan, uh, and there's no bearing given for that line. I'm not sure what the word plan means there either. As Unless according to the recorded plan. To the recorded plan. Now, this, this just simply amends the recorded plan yes. without amending the recorded plan physically? No. Okay. Yes. Do we have another comment? Let's get some puzzlements here. I was just going to say if Tom were concerned about that property line, which I'm not, I would be more concerned with the lack of the one on lot one. But I, I think I would defer to our planner whether this is uh, an adequate and legal thing to amend an existing plan. Have you seen the existing flat plan? No, I haven't. I, I would suggest that in order to make sure that we do as <laughs> much of a favor to the uh, Cumberland County uh, Registrar of Deeds that we, if it, I, I, I don't think it will be too much trouble. Um, to suggest that we do pick up uh, meets and bounds and bearings on lots one and lot two and the part of the right of way that's affected. The other thing I would suggest uh, in order to be as clear as possible, Mr. Skillings is to, Mr. Skillings I guess it is, is to have a note three that would indicate that this is an amendment to the existing plan. I mean, you have the plan reference down at the bottom, but it, um, I guess I'd just like to have it spelled out that this would amend the other plan so that you have it very clearly on the record. I think that's very good. Is there also a deed uh, revision that will be submitted with this? Maureen, do you have the answer to that or I would, go ahead. I have no revised deed either. Excuse me? I have no revised deed. Um, it was, now, this is something that is a uh, one paragraph procedure in the ordinance and the only thing that is specifically required to be pre presented to the planning board is a revised recording flat. It actually wouldn't be a revised deed, it would be cross deeds, you know, going Where one Where does the, the description other. of this revised boundary line get placed? I mean, as far as I understand, when I go to the registry of deeds, I don't look at maps, I look at deeds. Uh, uh, maps help me to understand it, but... Um, no, there's, in order to, as I understand it, 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 this would be the first step, and then a, the That's completion right. of the land swap would be to actually have the land swap, uh, land swap happen with cross deeds. Well, this okay. has already been uh, uh, finally uh, surveyed. All the final pins and everything mm -hmm. are all in. And I know that Dan DeFonso worked close with Ernie, and he double-checked on the setbacks and everything else with Ernie, yeah. you know, 20-foot setback. Because I told him to double and re-double-check on that, and he did. Uh, I trust you from that standpoint. I'm, I'm just looking at what the planning board is obligated to have and what we're supposed to be uh, approving and, and reviewing. I think... And whether or not the deeds have to be uh, in front of us. 
I don't believe we have to see the deeds. All we are proving is the change in the lot lines of an approved subdivision. They don't even have to do this. All we're saying is that we've allowed them, we approve the reconfiguration of these lots in this particular way. You're saying they don't have to bring it before the board? No, they don't have to execute the deeds. And if they execute them, if they execute them oh, wrong, it's sort of their As problem. All we're point, saying sure, is that, that they can make that subdivision look like this if they want We're saying to. if someone has a slow Tuesday night and wants to spend some money on a surveyor, this is one way to do it. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Keynesian theory. Everybody gets a little job. Um, do we have any more discussion? In which case... Um, <laughs> I have a motion if that'll Would help. Would you uh, that it get me off get the um, going here? The chair. I'd uh, like to move that uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the request of Mr. and Mrs. Larry Skillings and Mr. and Mrs. Peter Bayeko, is that the way you pronounce Baleco. it? Baleco. For an amendment to the lot lines of lots U-30-6B and U-30-6A off of Mitchell Road um, is approved in accordance with section 16-2-5 of the subdivision ordinance subject to the following conditions. Uh, one, that evidence of the ownership of the skillings of uh, lot two and the Balecos of lot one and the joint ownership of the right-of-way be uh, submitted to the town planner for review. Second condition is that the plan as submitted uh, be revised in two ways. One is to add the names of all abutters to lot one and lot two and the other is to add a separate note that uh, this um, plan amends the plan which is referenced on the uh, plan we have before us thank you second i'll second that any discussion I, I second it only because I think those amendments cover the fact that, that our proposal uh, uh, amends lots U, and I'm not trying to be picky, but lot U36B and U36A, and nothing on this plan indicates to us that mm. that's what we, we could be amending somebody else's lots for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the, the purpose of the intent is to do that, and I think with those amendments to the uh, proposal, it, that that will be taken care of. I accept the amendment to my motion. Very good. That no, was clear. Ver yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Did Did your motion include the uh, depicting the entire property line meets and bounds? For oh, both I suspect parcels? it did not, and I would no, like to have that be clear. Judy Wagner. I'd like to recommend one more um, addition. I don't know that it's properly a condition, but. Uh, it's my understanding that they do need a formal waiver since the driveway will be 10 feet within a property line, if we could just include that. A waiver from who? From the board. Something we would just grant. And if we're... And sure, grant. I, um, Maureen, I'll just say what I think and you can disagree or concur, please that um, section 19-2-9, subsection C2D, the zoning ordinance requires that all driveways be a minimum of 10 feet from property lines. And we have the ability to waive that. I have no desire to agree or disagree with that. I would merely like to let the board know that I raised that with the code enforcement officer who's charged with interpreting the zoning ordinance. And he said, because this is a part of site plan review, that that particular standard doesn't apply. And that, that's, that's his interpretation. Meaning because it's subdivision review, the site plan? Because that's under site plan. Because the, that particular standard that driveways have to be 10 feet apart is under the, the site plan ordinance. He doesn't feel you can you <coughs> apply it to things that do not require site plan review. 
And this is exception that in Stonegate we were told we could apply that. Well, I, in Stonegate, I would argue that you could apply it because there are a whole breadth of subdivision standards that talk about uh, configuration in the subdivision, that if you felt 10 feet was an appropriate reason, that, that you could find a, a good okay. reason for making a driveway 10 feet away from the property Well, I'll line. take that back. If there's, if there's any confusion, then I would just assume yeah. not grant a waiver. It's just assume they have that right. Any further discussion? We'll have a vote. All those in favor of the motion as read and amended, raise their right hands. All those against? None. It's passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, Do you have any questions? No, there would have to be the notations made that were the conditions, yes. And we'll probably, you could come in at the next meeting, I believe, and we could sign it even before the meeting. Is that uh, the only thing not? is, um, uh, the bank is waiting for this, and uh, another <laughs> month, <laughs> because, see, they ha we have to have the release from each parcel of land, and that's really going to mess me up. Oh. Um, that's the only problem. And it's been hinged on this for quite a while. That's why I was hoping that this would pass tonight because we can't <clears throat> we can't go forth unless um, we get this from the bank. Let me get this to the bank, and uh, and then the proceedings would would follow. Oh dear. We won't um, release it until they get this. I'd like to ask uh, through the chair, the mm -hmm. town planner, to uh, Maureen, would you feel comfortable in having the documentation submitted to you and reviewing it? And if you okayed it, then we would be. I, I guess we still can't sign the plan until uh, next week. I mean, until yeah, the next meeting. I, I, well, you you could sign the plan before the next meeting. It, the question is, you can't sign the plan you have tonight because it, it doesn't have the changes that, that right. you need. So I don't but, think uh, okay. I mean, we I think if board members were willing, it, we could arrange some way to meet so that you, you, we can collect the signatures that we need. If the plan reflects the conditions and you're able to get it a, a, a changed as soon as mm -hmm. possible, the board does have a workshop in two weeks. Um, and mm -hmm. and you know, it could even be done sooner than that if it's just a question of carrying around the actual plat, but I don't see how you could sign what we have tonight. Okay. If, would your yes. bank, uh, through the chair, would your bank be uh, amenable to a letter from the, from the town planner stating what the board's action was that it was conditionally approved so that the bank knows that, that, the, uh, that the subdivision was conditionally approved with simply a few minor uh, alterations and technicalities to the actual drawing of the plan that will be done in two weeks of that? Possibly. I'd have to get in touch with them. And, uh, I, that might expedite. I was, I, we'll go ahead. Go ahead. But, uh, the way the things are today, I don't know, the bank's pretty <laughs> I would say I would suggest that it will help you very much if the bank asks its counsel what the recommendation would be. It seems to me the issue here is how fast your surveyor is in in redrawing the plan. I mean, all Maureen has to do is call me up, and I can swing by in the morning and sign sign a plan as long as she's had a chance to look at it and accept it. That mylar was just passed in just the other day. You're right. Mm -hmm. Now, could there be some minor changes made on that, or does it have to be all? It's oh, up no. to your surveyor. A new, it's up to my surveyor. It's up mm -hmm. to your surveyor. Okay. Your surveyor is the when he makes that plan and signs it and seals it. It's it's really a um, very important document, and mm -hmm. you can't change it. We can't add to it. No, but you he would, can, right? But he can, and okay. he can do them very easily. Okay, that's fine. In which case, bring it into Maureen. We'll get the word out. We'll all uh, make an extra effort to to accommodate you, but oh, okay. I, I don't think your bank will go along with any kind I'll of... I'll have it in probably within the next uh, day, day or two. Fine. I think that's fine. In which case, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Item of new business is Ledgewood subdivision. Request by Joseph Fristacci for a minor subdivision review, a wetlands alteration permit, and a public access waiver for Ledgewood, a four lot subdivision located in the vicinity of Woodland and Mitchell Roads, 
We're looking tonight at application completeness in accordance with section 16-2-3 sub 2, 19-3-9-3 sub A, and 19-4-2 sub B of the subdivision ordinance. Madam Chair? Yes. Just a, a clarification, and, and I, I don't intend to recuse myself from this issue, but there is a, a notice in this application um, from the company I'm a, an officer of indicating a deposit of a certain amount uh, dealing with, with financial capability. I don't, my own personal opinion is that I don't think that that creates a conflict of interest simply because an applicant has a deposit. If the financing for this project were uh, <coughs> to be through that institution, uh, I'd reconsider uh, recusing. I'd like to, if there are any comments for the board, if, if you think that I'm in conflict uh, simply because the applicant has a deposit there, uh, speak your piece. Thank you. I would certainly concur with your uh, yes. suggestion in that area. Thank you. I think that's reasonable. I could withdraw the deposit if that would make you feel <laughs> <laughs> I, When I was thinking about that earlier, I said, well, actually, uh, if I bring it up, uh, it does a problem. <laughs> We have the applicant before us. Would you um, identify yourself and um, explain what Joe you're Pistacci. doing? My name is I am before you this evening to ask your acceptance of the uh, completeness of this application for Ledgewood, which is a minor subdivision of four house lots in the vicinity of Mitchell Road and Woodland Road. I have tonight to help me with the technical aspects of this, uh, Courtney, Courtney Jones from Courtney Smith. Jones. I know it's Courtney. <laughs> Courtney Jones from uh, Titcom Associates, and both uh, Al Frick and Jim Logan from uh, Al Frick Associates. And I think what I'll do is I'll allow Courtney to uh, walk you through this, and uh, I'll be available for questions as will the others. As Joe said, we're here for completeness of the application for a minor subdivision, and we are also applying for a wetlands alteration permit and a public access waiver. The uh, public access waiver is for um, lot four in this corner off Edgewood Road coming from South Portland. This is the town line of South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, right here. And the public ac access waiver is because there is no frontage on an approved town road for this lot. Um, and we are proposing to have a public access waiver to serve this lot as well as this existing lot will have now have an easement off of the extension of Edgewood Road for its access. The uh, wetlands alteration permit is for the proposed driveways. Uh, we're showing a proposed common driveway for <coughs> lot one and two. Um, and they'll be cutting through some Brayton soil. Let's do a little better on this other one. Section of 